wants coffee? Hey, who wants a pot of coffee? I just made coffee. You want a cup of coffee? Sure, there you go. Who wants coffee? Anybody else want coffee? Who wants coffee? And now it's time for the man with the caffeine, the new tropics for the brain. It's Coffee with Mike. Hang in, hang tight, grab your cup, and let's get this thing started. Hey everybody, welcome back to Java Chat. This is Coffee with Mike, and I have the pleasure of introducing you to a very interesting person. Uh, her name is Jory Rose. Jory, thanks for joining us today. You are so welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. I am so happy to be here. I got my coffee in hand. So cheers to- Cheers. <laughs> Absolutely. For those of you that know this format, we are having a coffee chat. Basically, it's like meeting down at a, a local coffee shop, whatever your preference, and hanging out with a friend, talking about things that matter. And in yeah. this case, we're going to be talking about what Jury does. And I'm going to let her explain it a little better because- I'm sure there's some nuances I don't want to miss when it comes to this. So, Jury, if you would, introduce yourselves to our listeners. Yes, thank you so much. So, again, I'm Jory Rose. I'm out in California in the San Francisco Bay Area. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice, which now due to COVID is all virtual, which has been amazing because I can expand my client base beyond outside, just those who can show up at my office door. That's awesome. And I am a mindfulness and meditation teacher. Um, so those are kind of my, you know, things you might find on my resume, but, um, How long I have you been doing that? Mom. I, well, that's a long question. I'll go back to that in a second because that's actually <laughs> part of my journey. Okay, that's cool. That's a much easier, uh, the short answer is I've had my private practice for four years. The long answer is I've been doing it since about the year 2000. So, you know, there's a wow. lot of story in between. There's a lot of story. You um, said, you I, said mom. What, 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 I'm, what? I'm a mom. Nice. Yes, I've got uh, two teenage daughters. Oh boy! Uh, this, wait, 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 two yes. teenage daughters. Two teenage daughters. God bless you. <laughs> you know, you know what I, and I'll be talking more about this too. But I love. It sounds like a cliche. I really love being a mom, but not just because I love my children, but because I take parenting really, really seriously. Oh, sure. And I've been working really hard at it, mm -hmm. and I I work hard at teaching people how to be good parents because parents often have really great intentions and often poor execution and <laughs> there's an um, understatement so I, for you yes. goodness <laughs> so i used to actually be really terrified of teenagers to me having teenagers was like this really scary unknown and you know mm -hmm. um not only were there a lot of risks involved and you know i was always mm -hmm. worried about safety mm -hmm. but would i be close with them mm -hmm. and i am not exaggerating when i say my daughters and i were we're incredible incredibly close. We have a, a conflict-free home. I have the beauty of having them as like amazing friends and sisters, and yet I get to be the mom at the same time. And it's a boundary and role that they respect, and yet we have a lot of fun together. So mm -hmm. I'm really, really <clears throat> blessed in who my daughters are, but it also has taken a lot of work to, to get us here, right? I can imagine um, that's a, that's a, that's a happy balance that most parents wish for, but really never know how to get to because the experimentation yeah. never quite goes the way. And I think some of that has to do with attitude. Some of that has to do with knowledge. Um, and a lot of it too is experience. And they yeah. think, oh, well, you know, I can either look at how I was raised and either want to emulate it or go the opposite. Yeah. And they don't ask, actually sit down and take the time to consider, wait, what kind of parent do I actually want to be? Number right. one. There you go. Along with their co-parent, right? That mm -hmm. conversation doesn't mm -hmm. happen. And then they also don't tune into the nuances of who is my kid actually, because they often parent to the kid that they wanted, wished, or hoped they had, not the one they actually had. And then there's the nuance of not only do I have different children, so I'm going to have to parent them differently, but also what worked yesterday may not work today, definitely mm -hmm. probably won't work tomorrow. So if I'm not fully present and aware of my mm -hmm. own reactions and of my own triggers and sensitivities, mm -hmm. then I'm not going to be able to be present to figure out who they are to actually show up authentically to raise them to be their authentic self. So in a yeah. nutshell, that's how I feel about parenting. It's but a, it's really fun because it, it's my daughter's a, it's and a I, great thing. It's a great thing. Yeah. And, and I'm a, I have an 18 year old son. I've only had one. So I don't have all of the joys of multiple children. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I say that in all sincereness, I, I had actually hoped that I would have a son and a daughter. Um, but I have a son who I'm very happy about and I'm very proud of. He's 
he just graduated this year. So he was one wow, of those congrats. that were affected by this whole COVID stuff. Um, I was not very happy with the way it was handled. I, I'm, I'm happy that something happened. Yeah. But I, I feel like he was it like was something of his past that was thieved away from him. And it's a huge milestone. It, it is. It's a huge milestone. Waiting for their whole whole lives. Yeah, and then and then to have most of it taken away because of a of a pandemic. Um, yeah. Granted, safety is first, but I mean, sure. you know, how do we how do we make up for that as parents? And yeah, I've noted that just being available and being there when when he's looking for something has gotten yeah. him to come has gotten him to come out of his man cave a lot more often than he used to. He actually yes. comes out now to talk to me. So I, I get it. I'm Way to go, Dad. That. Yeah, it's try 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 this way. Think. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep forgetting <laughs> I'm in reverse. I mean, you know. <laughs> anyway. Cool. So you you have a meditation practice. I want to dig on that. And yeah. and here's why. I I do my affirmations and I do some form of meditations i used to do a lot of meditations when i did martial arts like qigong and stuff like that mm -hmm. break it down what's it about well i can tell you this i used to live in my head i believed my thoughts i was always living with a lot of anxiety a lot of fears especially fears of the unknown mm -hmm. um which i you know was kind of raised, handed to me on a silver platter in, in many ways, as I like to say. Um, no fault of my, my mom's, just our family dynamics and some traumas that occurred in my family of origin and generations prior. That was the worldview, right? The world's a scary place. And so we got to stay really safe and protected as a result. <clears throat> but it kept me very fearful. It kept me very um, limited. I didn't really know who I was. Um, I was in that mentality of chasing what was next, what was next, what was next. And so in that hamster wheel of life, right, mm -hmm. we're spinning mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we're not fully present and not even really aware along the journey. Mm -hmm. And while I actually truly had everything I ever wanted, um, I woke up one day in my early 30s and was like, I don't remember how I got here. Oh, that's and not good. I, I, I literally had the life I created. I was married to my high school sweetheart who I'd been with since I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I, even though I had had, this was part of the long answer from earlier of my journey, even though I had already had a master's degree in counseling psychology and I knew I wanted to be a therapist, mm -hmm. I had gotten halfway through my hours only to realize I have no business being anybody's therapist. I'm 24 years old. I have no life experience. Um, and it really was painful when I saw people living in such a way that was unaware and they weren't wanting to create change. It was like, they just wanted people to fix and solve the problem without actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. And there was a day it came when I was working with a family in which the daughter 16 at the time had been suicidal. Mm -hmm. And the dad basically was like, she's not bleeding. She's fine. Eesh. And I was so infuriated and thought, you know, are you waiting for her to wake up with her dead on the bathroom floor for you to realize there's a problem? And this was a deep sensitivity of mine because my own father committed suicide when I was 10. So when I see such deep suffering occurring and someone asking for help and the parents dismissing it and saying, no, you look okay, so you must be okay. Mm -hmm. I decided to quit becoming an, a, a marriage and family therapist at that point and was a stay at home mom. I always wanted two daughters. I got my two daughters. And I would not trade just a moment of that time that I got to be home with them when they were little, like absolutely best years. And yet I woke up one day and said, I don't remember how I got here. And how do I know if this is the right place for me to be? Right. And how do I move forward? Like, mm -hmm. what do I do with this? Because I felt like I had this questioning of this waking up. And thought, I really want to be conscious and aware as I move forward in my life. I don't want to just keep going through the motions. I just don't want to keep doing what's next because I was also, also at that point where it was like, oh, I just really want to get engaged. Oh, I just really want to get married. Oh, I just want to buy the house. I just want to have a kid. And then I just want to have my next kid. So it was kind of like once all the boxes were checked and I was, you know, 28, 29 years old with two kids in the house and a stay at home mom, even though I had the education, it was like, what else was there to look forward to? I don't know who I was mm -hmm. outside of my role of wife and mom, 
I didn't know how to be an individual. I had never really gone through that normal experience of individuation and separation as every teenager should, because I kind of went like from my mom to my boyfriend who became my husband. And Mm -hmm. I didn't know myself at all. Yeah. And that that was this big awareness of like, wow, you know, really like, even though I consciously made all these choices, I'm not sure I was, I was aware and present. So it's this paradox, right? Like it was everything I ever wanted, but then something wasn't fitting right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I decided to go into therapy to try to figure this, you know, big problem of, you know, existential crisis. <laughs> right. And I was sitting in that therapist's office and I will get to meditation, but this is how I got there. No, this is good. This is, this is, I, I said in the beginning, if there's a rabbit okay. hole, let's run, let's run. Let's go. It's all good. And I'm sitting in my therapist's office for the first time. And I had this, this really visceral sense of this setting felt really good being in this office. And I thought, I also want to be on the other side of the couch. And so I, even though I had not gone toward my internship hours for eight years, I decided I wanted to go back and complete my licensure process. And in California, you need to complete 3000 hours within six years. And I had already bypassed that six years. So I had to start from scratch again, even though I got 1500 hours into the 3000, I had to start from scratch again. So I had contacted my old supervisor. It was um, January at this point. And I had always worked in schools. I thought I'd have to wait till September. And I was, Mm -hmm. that was fine. I just wanted to have that plan of, this is, I'm going to go back for this. Sure. As the universe would have my back. Um, I hadn't spoken to her in eight years. And there had been a school that came on mid-year and the intern lined up had dropped out the week before. And then I called. Perfect. So I literally got to start the following week, which led me to being in her office in which I saw a book titled Mindfulness. Ah. I I don't know what mindfulness is. What does that mean? And it talked about the rabbit hole. Like it led to a phone call. It led to an internet search where I literally ended up the following week. The timing was impeccable in which I started an introduction to mindfulness class. And it was a six week class. And on the very first night, it was about how to breathe. And I remember being guided in a 10 minute meditation. And I had no idea really even what mindfulness was yet. So to Mm -hmm. me, I thought mindfulness meant meditation, which I'll tell you is not actually accurate. They're related, but not the same. But I was guided in this 10 minute meditation. And I'll tell you, Mike, in those 10 minutes, I literally thought I was gonna die. I had never slowed down for 10 minutes to focus on my breath or just what I was experiencing in that moment ever. And that six week class, you know, it was just once a week where I actually had to drive over an hour to get to. Oh. It was enough to peak my interest to mm-hmm. say, I want to, I want to know more. Like, I don't know what this is, but I think it just changed my life. And so that introduction to mindfulness class led me to taking a training in which I got certified to teach mindfulness to kids. I ended up teaching that in the school I was working at for four years. I delved in on a deep personal level mm-hmm. into mindfulness and meditation. And then I also delved into it on a professional level of how to teach others and how to guide others and how to kind of, um, you know, be a mindfulness and meditation teacher. So it was like this parallel journey of both this personal and professional route that was completely intertwined in which I learned what it even meant to meditate, why meditation mattered. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, what I wanted to know is how can I use these tools to help me figure out who I am and what Mm -hmm. to do with my life? So let's, and, yeah. I was gonna say, so, so let's, let's take a look at the practice of mindfulness for a second, because there's, there's two complete rabbit holes to run down on this one. There's a um, lot. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, there's a ton. I, I can tell you on meditation that when I learned it in martial arts, um, we didn't go by time. We went by breaths. And literally that's, you know, the Chinese don't go by time when it comes to, to Chinese martial arts. It's, how many breaths did you breathe? I don't remember. Did you hit at least 45? Yeah. I doubt it because it wasn't that long and they go good mm-hmm. go back go finish up that's what it, that was that was part of the meditation process is you don't watch the clock 
This is not about a clock. This is about you and it's about your ability to be aware of what's going on. So I have a story about a clock. Let's go back to that when you're oh, done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, let me, we'll let, me let me let me write that one down. A clock. A clock. Yes. Okay. Um, so when we're looking at mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness, what does that really mean? Yeah. I define mindfulness as living with greater awareness, greater attention, and greater intention. So that sounds like, you know, beautiful, but what does that actually mean? <laughs> well, like I said, you know, we tend to live our lives on autopilot. Mm -hmm. You know, think about in a normal world when we're able to drive to work or drive our kids to school every day. Right. Um, you know, we get in the car and we get to our destination. We don't even have to think about it. We just arrive. Yeah. Well, that's really how we move through our lives, right? That was what happened to me. Like I woke up in my early thirties and was like, how did I get here? I was, I was there clearly. I was driving mm -hmm. the car, but I don't remember the process. <clears throat> I don't remember yep. having gotten there. So to me, the way I define mindfulness, because let me tell you this too, I did years of mindfulness training for some of the best teachers, some of the, like the, the ultimate teachers in this practice in the whole country. Mm -hmm. And I was still kind of confused with that sounds great, but what does it mean to my everyday life? How can I relate and integrate and, uh, you know, use these tools to help me figure this out? So awareness is the number one answer. It's all about being aware. So what do we want to be aware of? Well, we want to be aware of our thoughts that are arising. We want to be aware of emotions that we're experiencing. We want to be aware of sensations in our body, not just physical sensations like pain, but also intuition. You know, what is our body, the messages our body is telling us. Mm -hmm. And also awareness of distractions. Because if I'm not aware of my distractions, I'm going to pick up my phone every time I see the light go off, right? Yep. But I can otherwise, to be aware, is to say, oh, look, I saw that a text popped up. Okay, I saw a text. I'm still talking to Mike. Great, I can leave that there. Where normally without awareness, we see the phone, we pick it up, and now we're like on that rabbit hole, yep. right? Yep, it's, it's a shift so in when, tunnel vision. It's just kind of how humans are. Right, we're human. Okay, so awareness is the number one response. But I also want to bring in paying attention. So what mm -hmm. do we want to pay attention to? Well, we have typical habits and patterns and reactions and mindsets about how we move through our world. So my typical habit or pattern before, if there is a before, would have been, hey, I'm talking to Mike, I'm doing this, you know, whatever it is. Oh, look, I got a distraction. Let me, you know, my pattern's going to be, you know, I can't stay focused. I can't right. stay really present. Right. So I can have, I can pay attention to, oh, typically I might grab for the phone as soon as it goes off. Like it's a mission impossible you know, <laughs> kind of message that if you don't answer right. it in a moment, like it's going to combust. So I can pay attention to those typical habits, patterns, or mindsets. Right. And then the last piece is intention to then pause and slow down and say, why am I doing what I'm doing? And is reaching for the phone actually what I want to be doing in this moment? Or can I just acknowledge it and then stay present over here? Because we often have really good intentions, but don't have really great execution because we're so distractible. Yep. We're so not present. Yep. And we're not even aware that we're not mm -hmm. present. Right. It's, one of, it's one of the biggest things that I keep mentioning to some of my colleagues. I see a real serious lack of presence. Yes. Um, in just across the board in humankind today, it's, it's gotten yes. to a point where we've allowed things to distract us. And I'm not just talking about technology. I'm talking about a mere passing thought. Yes. And that's one of the things that we were taught. It was like, if you're in the midst of breathing, Thoughts are going to come up. You cannot blank out your mind. Human minds don't blank. They don't do that. No. Thoughts will come up. You look at the thought, you acknowledge it, you, you express gratitude for it, and you let it pass. And you wait yeah. for the next one because they're going to just keep coming. But be present and, like you said, being aware of what it is that's coming and then going, why that? Yeah. Why am I seeing a, 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 a toy soldier in the middle of this? Why am I seeing yeah. you know, my ex? So I'm actually going to... I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take that why question in a second somewhere really important. Good. Um, but yeah, you know, and to me, when, you know, there's another piece. So if you, if you were to hear the kind of more generic or a typical definition of mindfulness, it's being in the present moment and paying attention on purpose without judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's the, that's so the general, that's, that's the general. The, that's death. A, um, I, I changed up the answer to the definition because being in the present moment to me, isn't actually the intention. So the, okay. here's the interesting part. I think it's impossible to always be in the present moment. So here's what I want people to recognize. I don't want people to always try to be in the present. I want them to recognize the moment they're not present. 
because that to me is the more is, is the greater awareness. Oh, look at that. I thought, you know, I just, I got distracted because that to me is where we get lost is when we don't even notice that we're not present anymore. Mm-hmm. Paying attention on purpose. Great. That's, you know, the attention and intention piece of the, how I responded, but the non-judgmental part is also a part that I've always struggled with when I come up against this definition of mindfulness, because to not judge means that I'm not supposed to judge the thoughts that are coming in. It means that I'm not supposed to judge the emotions I'm feeling mm-hmm. or the distractions I'm having. But here's the problem. Inherently, as a human being, guess what? I have judgment. Yeah. We all I, have an inner, I have an inner yep. critic, yep. right? So I'm going <laughs> to judge myself. I'm going to judge others. That's simply part of being human because those judgments often keep us safe and protected because it's teaching us to not cross the street on a busy road, right? We're going to learn. Like <clears throat> our judgments have often served us until they don't. Yeah. So I struggle with this typical definition of non-judgment because as soon as I have a judgment, it could be easy to think, oh, I can't be mindful if I have a judgment because the definition said I'm not supposed to. Right. You'd be interested in hearing Cause. Cause Green was just on this podcast. He's one that has, mm. um, he just wrote a book called I Am Enough, how to squelch, mm. how to squelch the inner critics or the inner judges. They, yeah. They, yeah. And he, we, we went digging on that and you're just right there with it. It's Yeah. There's, there's so, so much, there's so much that battles for our attention. Yes. And it takes us away from our relationships. It takes them mm-hmm. away. It takes us away from our focus and attention of our work, yep. of our inner work. It takes us away from ourselves because we numb out of what's too hard to feel. So we yep. find our ways to permanently stay distracted. So we don't actually have to access what's really there. So it takes a lot of courage and vulnerability to be able to begin to practice this because it's, there's a willingness to say, I can acknowledge whatever is here and that's okay. I don't have to push it away. I don't have to grab and cling on to it. And so I'd rather instead say, oh, that's interesting. Look at that judgment I'm noticing, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm in awareness and observation of the judgment. And then I can have intention of whether or not to act on it or even to believe it to be true. And so that's how I define mindfulness. And, you know, we know that the mind wanders as far as neuroscience says, and I think it's a higher percentage based on the most recent study I found about it. I think it wanders more than 47% of the time. 47% is what neuroscience tells us. I think it's got to be more. It could be very I, easily. I mean, humankind in its condition right now in particular. Especially, right? Yeah. So where does our mind go when we're not present? Well, we tend to, you know, aside from, you know, the digital distraction, that's one area it goes but we've got rumination in the past. So rumination in the past would be to look like, oh man, I wish I didn't say that. Why did that happen? If only I could have redone that over. So we're like ruminating on something negative, wishing we could erase how we did, you know, something went down and we could, Mm -hmm. you know, have a do over. Or we get stuck on the past about something really positive. So this is something everybody right now in the midst of COVID is like, when do we get to go back to normal? Mm. Okay, that is rumination in the past. Yep. When is life going to be like the way it was? If only my kids could start school, you, you said, if only my son could have had the graduation that he should have had, right? Yep. So it's these if only statements or, oh man, that vacation was so good. I wish I were back on that beach right now. So like, even if it's something really positive, if we get stuck on that, it's going to take us out of being able to be with what is. Yeah. Right. Yep. Or we go to the future where we have all those beautiful and wonderful fears and unknowns where our mind can get really creative and go into worst case scenario <clears throat> and all the what ifs and the what ifs we tend to believe and we act as if they're already re- happening and real. And then we have all this anxiety because we're believing this some future yep. unknown. Yep. So the mind goes to the past, the mind goes to the future. And so back to your breath, this is where meditation comes in. The breath to me is like the leash on a hyper puppy. Oh, nice. So uh, a hyper puppy in which, you know, it's kind of funny. I've been giving this analogy for like 10 years and I actually got a puppy back in October. Nice. I was a pre, I was a pre COVID puppy purchaser um, <laughs> as opposed to like, you know, all the people who got puppies as a result of quarantine. Right. Um, but puppies are going to run around. It's what they do, right? We don't necessarily get mad at the puppy. We train the puppy. And one of the things that we do is we put the dog on a leash and that leash is something we can do to kind of bring him back to where we want him to be. Well, the same thing is true of our mind. And this is where meditation comes in. So if mindfulness is this informal practice of how to show up, how to be present with yourself and in whoever you're with or with whatever it is that you're doing, if that's the informal practice of, you know, 
again, the quality of presence you bring into your life. Then meditation is the formal practice in which you're strengthening the muscle for you to be able to do that. So it's like meditation is like going to the gym and doing your bicep curls and mindfulness is the ability to be strong to lift what you want to carry. So meditation to me, the way I define meditation, because I try to make it really relatable for people, because again, kind of like we, you know, we mentioned a little bit lightly on is people are going to have a lot of assumptions and judgments and misconceptions about what meditation is and is not. And one of those that many people believe is I'm supposed to have a clear mind. But you know, right? what's really, what's, what's really interesting about that is the one of the first things that I was taught. Don't ever, don't ever count on that. Exactly. Well, that's the thing. That's the assumption. So people assume I'm going to sit down in meditation. I'm going to sit cross-legged with my hands in some mudra. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to focus on my breath. I might have a, a chant or a mantra, right? <laughs> and as a result, I will feel peaceful. I will feel zen-like. I'm going to have this clear mind. I'm going to be fully present. And yet the reality is, as soon as you sit down in meditation, usually the mind ramps up. Oh, yeah. Every sensation in your body is going to become heightened awareness. So now you're going to have itches in places you didn't even realize you could scratch, right? You're going to be distracted by every single sound. And all of a sudden you forget that you're already breathing. And so it's going to be hard to connect with your breath. Yeah. It, my, <laughs> so I can remember certain times when I did do meditation that not only did the brain ramp up, but so did the emotions and yes. the emotions ramped up so much. And, and this is during a time when I was an active practicer. So literally um, there were certain trees that suffered from my shins because yeah. I was that, I was that charged and it was, and it was over memories of things that I had regretted doing. Um, yeah. Then of course my, my master, Shifu came up and said, so feel any better? I'm like, no, he goes, good, go kick the tree some more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, I, but I just did. He goes, get it all out. Go kick the tree some more. Yeah. And it did two things. One is it taught me to watch what I'm meditating on. That's one. Because mm -hmm. if I do end up kicking something, he's going to tell me to keep doing it. <laughs> the mm -hmm. other one was, why did I allow that to happen? Why wasn't I paying yeah. attention to what I was focusing on? Um, there's no such thing as a blank mind. In my, in my opinion, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, neuroscientist. I, 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 just, I just don't. No, and, and I don't think there is. And in fact, if, again, if we hold that attachment to be the belief that that means we're good at this, then we're going to continue to chase something that, you know, we're never going to catch. Um, I saw this great New Yorker cartoon once, and it was two monks meditating in a monastery. Oh, good. And one of them is saying to the other, are you not thinking what I'm not thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was awesome. Um, would have been funny if one so, of them went, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, you know, so meditation, so the way I define meditation is to simply create the space for stillness yeah. and silence to slow down, to observe whatever is arising without judgment. And usually we focus on the breath, but we can focus on anything as an object of attention and meditation. Yep. So that's another misconception people have, because sometimes here's the thing. If you're really anxious, your breath is not a good source to focus on because oh, when you're yeah. anxious or stressed, you're, you have worse. these short, shallow breath. And yep. so the more attention you bring to your breath, the harder you're going to have a time to yep. breathe. Yep. So Absolutely. if you have trauma, if you've got PTSD, if you've had abuse, the breath is not a safe place for you to go to internally in your body. Mm -hmm. So it's not even always the focal point of a meditation. So you could mm -hmm. have an externalized source, like your feet on the ground or your hands or sounds or sight, um, you know, or words. And so this is the, the funny clock story I was going to say. Okay, good. Um, yeah, this is just rolling right into everything that we're talking perfect. about. This is perfect. So uh, years ago, I was invited. There's a, a national lab mm -hmm. uh, about 20 minutes from where I live. That's a national, really high-end security lab where, I don't know, I think they produce missiles of some kind. Nice. Um, and I got invited to come lead a meditation for their meditation group because they were celebrating 10 years of a meditation group. There, which, that was really cool. All these, you know, really That's brilliant, awesome. probably like rocket scientists, yeah. like legitimately, right? Like doing yeah. meditation. And the two other people that came um, the weeks before me, I was really honored to be in that company of these really top meditation teachers in the Bay Area. So I was really humbled to be there. Awesome. So as I arrived and I had to go through clearance and fingerprints <laughs> and security to just get on their campus. All the, all the joys kind of, of a cool of, experience, of right? A secure, of a secure facility. Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't even know what it's like now, but then, you know, um, so we're getting ready and the meditation room was actually this huge long conference table. And at the end were whiteboards with all sorts of like math equations. And again, you know, rocket scientists mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, missile mm -hmm. launches or who knows. Um, and as we're assembling, one of the founders of this meditation group goes and pulls a chair over to the wall, stands up and takes the clock off the wall Perfect. and puts it outside Perfect. and brings it, you know, comes back into the room. So again, I'm being aware and paying attention without judgment. So I simply observe, oh, that's really interesting. I'm noticing you took the clock off the wall. And he says, yeah, you know, we find it's really hard to meditate with the sound of the ticking of the clock. It's really distracting. Oh boy. It's one of those loud ones. Okay. Yeah. I, that and makes sense. I said, um, I, I don't want to judge whatever you've been taught in meditation and because and is the big keyword I always say, and and not but, because the but would negate the prior part mm -hmm. and allows mm -hmm. them both to be true. Yep. And I'm going to venture to say that the real definition of meditation would be to learn to meditate with the clock. Now that's that another interesting concept. Have, we could do it both. Yeah, absolutely. How can you have, you know, the key to meditation for me is not how can I slow down and be still and create stillness and silence and focus on my breath only in a quiet environment, but how can I do this in everyday life? Because everyday life is not quiet. Everyday life has full of distractions. And I really want to teach people how to take their meditation off the cushion. That if I'm not giving you the tools to integrate this into the moment you're having an argument with your spouse, into the moment you're dealing with traffic, into the moment you're disciplining your kid, into the moment of dealing with a world pandemic, then I haven't taught you how to meditate. Because if you can only meditate on that, I'm pointing at my cushion right here, on that cushion in a quiet environment where the conditions are present and perfect to be, right. you know, focused on your breath. Right. That I'm, I, I'm not trying to judge, but then you're not learning how to really meditate. Because mm -hmm. it's great if you can do it there. Yep. And if you're not able to transfer that to actually integrate into when the stress and distraction and noise of every part of everyday life is present, then I'm not doing my job as a meditation or mindfulness teacher. Yeah. And he didn't bring the clock back up on the wall. He probably just got frustrated that I wasn't <laughs> what he wanted. But that's the really practical application for me, yeah. right? That yeah. to me, and so this is um, a visual that I like to give that I think is, you know, over the years people have told me is one of the things that they remember the most. Mm -hmm. Because if I say that meditation is like going to the gym and mindfulness is like being strong out in the world, the reason this meditation matters is because every time you sit down with the intention to meditate, you're literally rewiring your brain for new habit. Because as that thought comes in, as those emotions arise, as the distraction of the clock or whomever is present, as the sensations in your body, you are just being like, oh, wow, that's interesting. I'm noticing this is here. Yep. Okay, let me just choose yep. a different response to it, right? Yep. Like, oh, that's yep. interesting. And that's literally how I say it in my mind. Cause that's not judgmental. If I'd be like, Oh my God, why is that here again? That's a judgment. And now it's bigger. <laughs> yeah. So I've got to just observe it, be an observation. Oh, that's interesting. And let me just come back to my breath or come back to my hands or whatever the focal mm -hmm. point of attention. So here's the analogy I give. Imagine you uh, approach a snowy field mm -hmm. and you're trying to get across the field and right. there's really only one path across the snow. And in fact, this path is so well established that the snow embankments on either side are like 10 feet high. Like this is a really well-traveled path. Sure. Here's the problem. You don't like where it takes you on the other side. But every time you get to this field, you're like, oh, I got to get across. Here's this path. I'm going to go there. And oh, but wait, I don't like how it feels to be here. Or I don't like how the process of getting there or whatever it was. So. You have to first start with awareness of, oh, wow, there's that path I don't like. Without awareness, you just keep going down it. Right. But with attention, you can say, okay, let me maybe step another path. Mm -hmm. And so with, you know, each time you approach this field, you take new footsteps over here. And eventually over time, even though in the beginning, it's going to be really, really hard because it's going to be hard and cold and wet and it's going to sink. And you're going to be like, but wait, there's a much easier path over here. Why can't I just do that? Well, because you don't like where you're going. Yep. But if you set the intention every time to keep walking this new path mm -hmm. over time, 
that becomes a new well-established pathway, taking you where you want to be. It's intentional. It's on purpose. And over time, the more you do this new one, that old one's going to get snowed over. Right. And the embankment's going to eventually become just as high. It just matters how long you want to take it. Exactly. And so, you know, every time we sit down in meditation to practice, that's what's happening in our brain. Every time we like, oh, look, that, look at that thought. Look at that sound. Look at this emotion. It's like new footsteps in the snow. And we can actually build a new response to our triggers. Mm-hmm. So actually, when you're in the middle of the argument, you can be like, oh, wow, I just noticed I was raising my voice and I don't like how that feels. And I know you're going to react and that's not going to be good for us to come to a, a healthy conclusion of how to manage this you know, distress right now. Mm-hmm. So you know what? Even though I started yelling, I'm just going to pause and take a few deep breaths so I can calm down my brain and calm down my body and, and figure out actually how I want to, what I want to say. Makes sense. And we can put it in the moment. Cool. I'm going to talk with you in a minute. We're going to take a short break. I want to talk a minute about um, how you can begin practicing this because most people that know of the general nature of this don't know how to start. Absolutely. Um, and I want to dig into that. I also want to share a story with you about one of the things that I did that was really interesting. I mean, uh, from, a, from a standpoint of I didn't know this was possible. I didn't think it was going to work. And it actually, it actually saved an evening in a nightclub from going complete brawl. Wow. Uh, and I'll, I'll share that with you when we I come back. I can't wait to hear. Yeah. We'll be right back, guys. We're going to take a short break and then uh, have a word from the sponsors. Uh, and then we'll get right back into this. And we're back. Cool. Um, so let's 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 continue with that path on why. Yes. So, you know that uh, there's so many things I can continue to say, and I think my team and I could probably talk for like the next four hours about we, all this. We have we have this guys. Picture this. We have this big highway with about 50 exits on it. We could take any one of them we want. <laughs> we're yeah, yeah, to, yeah. We're just trying to pick one or two. But I, I, I want to go back to the or comment on the question of why for just a moment, because this is where I see people really, really getting stuck from mm-hmm. actually implementing these tools in a way to create change. Because here's the reason, like, why does any of this matter? Well, that's not the question I was going to ask, but why does any of this matter? It's because people are unhappy. Mm-hmm. They're stressed. Mm-hmm. They're anxious. Mm-hmm. They're stuck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They don't know how to move forward. They're fearful, especially right now with the pandemic, they're Mm -hmm. in reaction. Mm -hmm. And if we can just slow down and be intentional in our responses, the key for all of this is to figure out how to respond and not react in each moment. And we have to have the ability to understand that, you know, when our emotions are fired off, our brain shuts down and we can't access our tools. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's a reciprocal relationship of our emotions and our executive functioning. Yep. And yet, while we know it's possible to gain new tools, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Here's the one area where I see people getting most stuck from actually creating the new habits and the mm-hmm. new change that they're really mm-hmm. wanting mm-hmm. is because whether it's in meditation in that formal setting or whether it's in everyday life, there's the one question that keeps them in judgment and in reaction. And that is the question of why. If you have, okay, let's say you're sitting in meditation and Mm -hmm. you have the thoughts come up or you have the sounds that are distracting or the emotions. If you ask yourself, why am I thinking this? Why am I feeling this? The inherent question is as if something was not meant to be, like it's not supposed to be this way. Mm -hmm. If we sit here in the middle of the pandemic and say, why is this happening? You know, why, why, why can't I manage this better? Why can't I figure out how to work from home with greater focus? Or anytime you ask why, there's an inherent judgment or belief that it wasn't supposed to be this way. And because of that question of why, I see this all the time, it increases our reactions. So it's almost like you have a thought and thoughts, emotions, and sensations, because of the way our physiology works and the way the brain is designed, we feel them almost, you know, instantaneously as they're interconnected. So you have, you know, let's say a sensation in your body, which you're used to labeling as anxiety because you get mm-hmm. that pit in your stomach. So you like feel mm-hmm. a pit in your stomach. You instantly think, oh, I'm anxious about something. And then you have the emotion of anxiety where it begins to take over, where you feel it more. 
And then if you go to the question, why am I anxious? Guess what happens? That pit in your stomach gets bigger. The thoughts start to ramp up. The emotion feels stronger. So every time you say, why is this happening to me? Why can't I focus better? Why can't I cope better? Why am I so reactive? Why, you know, why, why, why? Those thoughts, emotions, and sensations all heighten. Mm -hmm. So the antidote to the why is to just accept. Now, a lot of people will say to me, but Joy, I don't want to, how do I accept what I don't like? How do I accept this pandemic? Because I don't like it. It's causing me all this financial distress, emotional distress, sleeplessness, anxiety mm -hmm. over my kids. Do they get to go to school or college? Like, if I accept it, that doesn't mean I have to like it. It just meant, simply means I need to honor that it's what's here. Yep. And the more I am in denial or resistance, the harder the situation is going to be. The more I can accept it, the more I can be with what is. And the question of why, as I've taught this for years and work with so many clients, I see the question as why, of why is this happening to be the trigger to not accepting it. Mm -hmm. We've, I've done that with some of my old students as well. Uh, it's when they get this, I'm going through a hard life. It's like, okay, yeah. all right. And what about it? What did, well, what do you mean? What about it? It's just, well, what is it about your life? That's so hard that you can't change what's going on. Well, I have no control over this. Okay. So if you can't control that, what can you control about you? Yeah. Well, what, what, but, but no, 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 no. Yeah. what's outside is outside. It is what it yeah. is. And a lot of people hate that cliche, but it is the it's truth. True. It is what it is at the point of how are you going to thrive in the midst of what's going on? Yes. Cause you and I both know entrepreneurs that even in the midst of COVID, they're very successful. They're doing very well. They've, they've figured yeah. out another way to do something. I, one of my best friends that lives out in Ventura County was just about to launch a um, home inspection business uh, latter part of last year. COVID hits in February. He had, he, had, he had 16 inspectors ready to go. Wow. Poof. Poof. What did he do? He started refurbishing watercraft trailers. He's an entrepreneur. I mean, he, he's also an angel investor. So he just, he's always looking for what part of what market can I how dig can into? I, and how, how can, can I, I thrive pivot? in the midst of this? How can I pivot? And how can I thrive in this dealing with that? Now that's business. When we're talking about just being, you know, dealing with life for those of the, for those that are in the professional realm of work, you know, all of a sudden they're jobless and they're having to, they're having to take unemployment or they're looking for new work and nothing's alive in their world. Yeah. So what do I do now? It's like, yeah. how do I, how do I deal with this? We've got college kids that are coming out and going, the job market is kind of crappy right now because there's a lot of stuff that's not open. What do I apply for? So how, how would you suggest somebody like, cause there's a lot of young people that listen to this too. Yeah. How do you suggest they can take a look at this along with what you've just given? How can they take a look at this and really go, well, it is what it is. How do I get present? How do I, how do I start yeah. acknowledging what is and how do I start getting out of the, the wrong mindset uh, while being mindful and thinking of what I can do? Yeah. You know, Mike, I, it, it's a great question and it's one that is, is a really important step to take next because all this is great and how do I do it, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to give the both kind of the mental, emotional mindset component and then the very physical, tangible, what do I do, you know, in yeah, that yeah, reality yeah, yeah. answer. Yeah. So there's both sides of it, right? Mm -hmm. I'll go with the kind of mental, emotional component first. One of the very first ways to start all of this is to really check with your expectations. Because as we know, as you know, mindfulness is rooted in Buddhist meditation practice. We know that one of the fastest paths to suffering is attachment to an outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's a fancy <laughs> way of saying I had an expectation it was going to be different. Yeah. Now, one could say, but Mike, shouldn't I have expected that when I graduated college, I was, or graduated high school, I was able to have a graduation ceremony? Like that was an actual, like normal expectation I should have had. Yep. My kids started school yesterday. Shouldn't I have expected that I could have? actually had them at school versus at home in their rooms. Like that was a, a realistic expectation. Yeah, absolutely. That was. And we also know that the most constant thing has changed. Mm -hmm. And the more we expect things to stay the same, the more suffering we're causing ourselves in the present moment when things are constantly changing. Absolutely. So it's really a practice in resiliency and adaptability to be able to say, yeah, I did not see this coming. 
This is exactly the opposite of what I wanted or wished or hoped. And in absence of an expectation, I can be easier with what is. Easier said than done, 100%. Sure. But as sure. far as a mindset, <clears throat> that is one of the first places to begin. Because again, we go through our life thinking that we have this this vein of, you know, this veil of control. And I think this is one of the things that COVID has taught us is, hey, you guys, this is like COVID talking. Hey, you guys, I know you all were living this like nice, comfortable life in which you felt in control of everything. And guess what? I'm here to tell you, by the way, you're not. The rug got pulled out from the whole world. Everything got put on pause. And to me, the message of the universe in this whole pandemic is a very honest message of, hey, you guys, you got to be present because everything you thought you had control over is actually temporary. And so, you know, if there was ever a time to respond and not react, it's now, and it's time to learn these skills of resiliency because we had this perception that we had control over everything. Yeah. And we actually, as far as I'm concerned, and you kind of already touched on it, as far as I'm concerned, we only really have control over two things, our breath and our response to whatever's happening. Yep. Everything else is out of our control. But it's the belief I had control that is causing me pain, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's the first like mindset conceptual piece. Easier said than done. All this is easier said than done. It's never a one and done. Like, but I did that. And why am I still suffering right now? Well, do it again. Yeah, because right? you did it once. Nope, you're going to have to keep doing it over and over and yep. over again. Yep. So the actual tangible piece is, well, I know when I first started learning to meditate, I was told by my teachers I had to do it for 20 to 40 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, um, yeah, that's not happening. I'm a busy mom. And if I've got 20 to 40 minutes a day, I guarantee I'm not going to be spending it in meditation. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> and I had an expectation. I had to look a certain way. So again, let go of the expectation. Can I meet myself where I'm at? And do it in a way that's, uh, you know, attainable for me to find success in. Because if I don't mm -hmm. succeed at it, I'm going to have the judgment, I can't do this. And then it's going to be that, you know, that spiral. Oh, yeah. So meet yourself where you're at. And what does that look like? Well, when you get out of, you know, when you wake up in the morning before hitting, you know, the alarm to turn it off, assuming you have somewhere you have to get up in time for these days. But before rushing out and just starting your day just on autopilot, just pause. You know, take a moment, lie in bed, you know, put maybe your hand over your heart or on your, on your diaphragm and just kind of feel your breath and feel your body and take a few deep breaths and just notice yourself breathing with yourself lying there, maybe having gratitude for woken up in the morning, maybe having compassion for the difficult night's sleep you had. And just take a few deep breaths, because as you take those breaths, it's going to calm the brain, it's going to calm the body. That's like the, the breath becomes that leash on the hyper puppy. So wherever your mind is at, you kind of just bring it back here, perhaps set an intention for the day. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I breathed for 30 seconds, that felt really nice. Okay, now I'm going through my day, I'm really distracted, and I have the awareness of, oh wait, I'm really kind of hyped up again. Okay, let me just pause again. Maybe every time I sit down at my computer to, you know, check an email or get on my next call, let me just take a second. So I'm actually present and because the breath brings us back in so I can go through my day and take these little mindful moments where I can pause and then when you do that you recognize oh that little mini break of 30 seconds of breathing in and out for five you know five times I feel a little bit less stressed out about this upcoming phone call or I feel a bit more prepared because I've tuned in to wow I'm actually feeling really confident right now yeah. or Oh, wait a second, I feel like actually I'm prepared. Let me see what else I can do to be more prepared. Whatever it is, mm -hmm. that taking that moment to pause is going to help. Outside of that, it's the awareness to recognize something's not working in your life. Now, my guess is everyone listening here to your show is human. <laughs> Well, you and know, we have those extra friends that happen to listen to things once in a while. From So, oh, you know, world. making the assumption that <laughs> everyone here is human means that we all have stuff that isn't working for us. Mm -hmm. And to kind of go back to that idea of mindset, do I believe this is just how it's supposed to be and life sucks and this is hard? Or do I believe that growth and change is possible? Because if I believe that growth and change is possible, then I can take a moment take a deep breath, observe what's arising, come back to compassion rather than judgment and try again. 
And so it's really the resiliency to overcome each moment whenever we're getting stuck. Mm -hmm. Again, I know that sounds a little fluffy and easier said than done, but it really is as simple as just pausing and breathing. Because if that's all you do, like if you do nothing else than just take a minute and breathe, like that will almost be enough because it'll be the monkey wrench that will get thrown into those patterns of reactivity. It'll be the monkey wrench to get you out of autopilot and into that driver's seat. Yep. Taking that moment to pause is the monkey wrench of distraction to awareness. It's that simple. We make it harder than it has to be. You know, it's the most simplest thing, but it's the hardest thing to remember to do. It's, it's also, well, and that it's because that other part of us goes, but I don't want to let go. But I don't yeah. want to, I, I want to hold on to this because it feels good, even though it doesn't serve me. So can I say something to that? Yeah, because please. That, that's is, why I brought it up. <laughs> this is where I love going deep with my clients is they're like, but Joy, I'm really stuck. Okay. How is staying stuck serving you? Oh, it's not. I hate it. I'm reactive. I'm in this horrible marriage. I'm in this difficult situation at my job. Whatever it is, I hate being stuck. Okay, but how is it serving you? Mm -hmm. Well, it's familiar. You know Very. how to do it. Mm -hmm. it, it it's, it's predictable. Maybe you're, you were raised in a family in which struggle was normal, so you don't believe you are worthy or capable of being in greater ease. Right? I mean, whatever it is, there is some secondary benefit you're gaining by staying stuck. And at the root of it, it's because it's harder to change than it is to stay stuck. And that's, and that's, the, and that goes back to the old cliche, humans hate change and all of that stuff. Um, wanted to share something with you. Um, I learned from one of the old masters that I knew, um, a, a meditation that was that fast hmm. and it was used when I was a bouncer. I used to be a cooler. If you remember the movie Roadhouse? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was Patrick. The difference was I wasn't the manager, but I was Patrick. If something, if anything went sideways in, a, in, in the nightclub that I was working at, I was the one they would call to go calm it down. And cause I was the only one that knew how to use my mouth instead of my hands. Yeah. So, and one evening it was busy. We were packed <clears throat> and I happened to be sitting in the back corner there was a little kitchen uh, with a little bar that people could get tapas and stuff like that. And I happened to be back there. It was loud. I was annoyed for some weird reason. I couldn't figure out what was going on. It's just mm. like the energy in here is just backwards tonight. Usually it's like everybody's here to have a good time. Something's wrong tonight. And I remembered what my, my friend taught me. I said, well, screw it. Let's try it. And went into breathing. I actually believe the music softened yeah. in my ears. And I started hearing a conversation. And the mm. conversation was not good. And I said, okay, where is this conversation? I couldn't pinpoint it by sound. So I opened my eyes. It was on the other side of the nightclub around the corner where I couldn't see it. Wow. So I picked up, started walking, grabbed two other guys with me, walked up. A fight was just about to break out. It would have involved mm -hmm. five people and it would have started a full brawl. And it was funny because they all looked at me and like, what's up? What's up? I said, just follow me. Just follow me. We get over there and they're like, how did you know this was going down? I says, I don't know. And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> yeah. But you're going to be the weirdo who believed your intuition and the, heard a conversation across the room. No one would get that. I was known. I, I was known as, as I was in that profession. I was known as the guy that could tell before fights would break up. I was that guy. Mm -hmm. I, I was out with my, at that time I was out with my girlfriend in a completely different club. I wasn't even working. We were hanging out. And I said, it's time to go. And she goes, no, I want to stay. I said, all right, it's fine. So we stayed. Not but a minute later, fight breaks out right behind her. I had to grab her and pull her away and walk out. And then I went up when you guys were leaving the club. I said, next time I say it's time to go. She goes, I got it. We'll leave. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, again, it goes back to this being mindful, being aware of what's going on. It's tuning in. When you, when you get to a certain point. And yeah. trusting what and you're trusting what tuning you're, into. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you eventually get to that point where, okay, this isn't just a karinky dink. This isn't just intuition. This is actually knowing what's happening before it happens and being, and being aware and okay with it. Cause at the time of what that was for me was if there's trouble starting, I'm leaving. I don't need to be yeah. involved in it. I'm not trying to get anybody hurt. I'm not trying to get myself hurt. Yeah. But I, I think, I think a lot of that just goes back to everything that you explained. It's the practice of resilience. It's the practice of knowing. And like you said, being okay with it. Yeah. Um, 
we have two we have two states in life growth or decay there's no in between I, I, something i learned in some of the self development courses i took there is no such thing as being stable being mentally stable has to do with growing consistently yeah if we're not growing we're dying yeah. 100% yeah and i'm not i'm not willing to die not like that and people are living in a state of unawareness in which is the slow and long and often painful death much more painful than they think you just you talked yeah. about it when you when you have your clients and saying that how is that serving you now well it's familiar yeah familiarity is killing you yeah i'm i'm a little more blunt about things as you can tell but it's it's one of those deals where it's like look here's you <laughs> yeah here's what's happening <laughs> well and here's you know here's the thing to kind of bring it to a full circle is when i started this practice I didn't know who I was because I didn't, I believed my thoughts. I didn't trust my body because I had this cognitive dissonance of what I felt and what I, when I thought, and I thought the thoughts were true because they were logical, mm -hmm. but it disconnected me from myself. Yep. And so when I finally learned to quiet my uh, attachment to the thoughts, right? There wasn't the thoughts I didn't quiet, but quiet my attachment to the thoughts mm -hmm. and tune into my body. And I'm like, Oh, look, there I am. That's interesting. I've been there all along. Which, in fact, I don't know if any of you guys have seen The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Have you seen that movie with Ben with Stiller? That, that's, okay, I missed that one. Ben Stiller. <gasps> okay. That, I'll have that to go watch actually, it now. That's, yeah, I'll have to go watch it now. Um, but it's <clears> basically <throat> this idea of you're there all along, it, but you just don't notice yourself, right? I mean, it's a great movie, but that to me was the takeaway. Maybe everyone's going to have a different takeaway, but he goes on a journey to ultimately find that he's always been there. He just didn't realize. And that's how I felt. And I still have the ticket stub from that movie because it, it, I watched it at a point when I was on the cusp of like, oh shit, I think I have to get divorced. And, um, but what I was gonna say was, part of it was recognizing that I was in the known and I was kept fearing the unknown. But the more I tried to make change in what I knew it wasn't working. And so I had to make this mindset shift from the known being the place of safety and security because it was here mm -hmm. to actually all of that happiness quote happiness safety security actually had to reside in the unknown i had to get uncomfortable to be able to actually make the change you but it was to like, sound the, like an entrepreneur now you know that right yes the biggest <laughs> shift was wow that is amazing because it's actually in the unknown that i get mm -hmm. to create mm -hmm. and isn't that awesome so like to go from seeing this unknown as this big black full of abyss of fear to awesomeness because I get to create it and I'm mm -hmm. consciously active in that like that's incredible and I did I ended up getting divorced I had never you know been alone a day in my life and so it was the biggest step towards the, uh, the abyss and it got me to where I needed to be it's kind of interesting that because I, I have other friends that have been very close through what you've been through and we're never alone a day in their life so to speak um and when you look at the challenge of being alone which is this big black void of <laughs> you know fear right yeah well fear is the fear standing in front of it that's that's what that's what throws up the veil that it's a big black void it's not a big black void we all know that now but fear stands in front of it after fear comes in surety which just leads back to fear. So it's like we're trying to run through a bunch of curtains to see if there's anything on the other side thinking that there isn't. And we're going to hit a brick wall somewhere along the way. And we never hit the wall. Yeah. We could slow down. We might trip up a little bit, but there's no wall. Yeah. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are, are worried that there's this huge wall is going to stop us. If, if you're really being honest about what you're facing, when you have to make such a very, very serious decision like that, that's a huge decision. It was hard for me huge. to make that decision too. I mean, it was insane what went on after that as well. And I was in that part of my life where I had forgotten mindfulness. I was like, out. Um, you could say I kind of checked out too for a while. Mm -hmm. But the idea of understanding that that had to happen in order for me to be able to move into building the business that I'm building now, building the, 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 the different you know, followings and social, building this podcast. And this was a, this was a, a side thing. This was like, I did it only because I happened to come across Anchor and I thought it was cool. Yeah. Now it's become a podcast and I get to bring cool people like yourself on here to come on, share your experiences, your stories and yeah, stuff like this where people can sit there and go, okay, 
yes, I do have a problem with the unknown. Here's a little hint. So does everybody else. You are not alone on yeah. that one. But yeah. look at what can happen on the other side. Yeah. Some people and think people, on the, some people think the other side is is oh, but it's going to get worse. Well, what were you looking and, for? Well, what were you looking for? Yeah. Were you looking for were you looking for something better and expecting something better? Mm -hmm. Or were you looking at the reality of things and seeing how you could navigate it better? Yeah. You know, these are the kind of questions that get me excited to talk about because <laughs> people have such a, a fearful slash limited view. Like they can only, they only want to see mm -hmm. so far in front of them. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they end up living a limited life. Either they're not authentic, they're not authentically being themselves. They're not living fully because they're letting fear and anxiety hold them back. They're not feeling fulfilled because they're in a relationship that isn't quite what they thought it would be, but it was just good enough. And so it's better than being alone. And, and so, yeah, you know, I really believe that growth and change is possible. I wouldn't believe be in the business I'm in if I didn't ultimately believe that to be true. And honestly, right, because I, authenticity is one of my highest values. I do not teach anything I don't live. And my clients as a therapist end up learning a lot about my life, not because I do gratuitous storytelling, but because I want to honestly say, yeah, this is where I was stuck and here's how it looked like for me to get through it. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. Because if anyone was most stuck, it was me. And I'm not putting myself at a higher level of stuckedness. It was just, hey, I ultimately believed I could not grow and change. Yeah. I had an ultimately fixed mindset about my worldview, about my roles, about my capabilities. And let me tell you, I'm unstoppable now because there is nothing in my way to say I can't other than my old mindset, which I just don't believe anymore. I think a lot of people are still at that point. Um, well, at least I won't say a lot because um, there's no, there's no percentage, measurable percentage. But what I can say is what I witness on social media, which I, it's part of my, my agency's deal. We watch what's go, what goes on, what's trending. The amount of fear that's running around right now yeah. On all fronts, whether it's, it's pervasive, it's, it's insane. I mean, I, I look at it from the standpoint of why are you allowing this to affect you in such a manner yeah. that you are literally paralyzed from making a move that can seriously shift everything for you? Yeah. How many books are written on this stuff? I mean, yeah. there's a real estate book on this. I mean, it's called yeah. Shift Happens. If you're, if you're, the best way to keep yourself stuck is just to be unwilling to recognize the truth. Yeah. And which is why I think it's all about awareness. And, you know, one of the areas, um, you know, that this is really coming to the forefront and one of my biggest passions and, you know, talk about pivoting and kind of meeting the needs that I see at the most right now is actually as this is being aired. So this is perfect <laughs> timing for it is I am launching a parenting membership. Ooh. That, um, yes, actually through Friday, August 21st, okay. so through the end of this week, um, there is a founding member price in which people can join. The price is going to go up after that just slightly. But what I am really, really passionate about right now is helping people recognize that these fears that are mm -hmm. going on as, be as mm -hmm. due to COVID and this beginning of the school year, because we all, you know, the school year halted in mid-March. Yep. And I guarantee you, we <clears throat> never, ever, ever thought we'd have to start the school year off like this. Yep. There was not a glimmer in anyone's eye that this was lasting this long. Yep. And as a result, we've got remote learning, we've got hybrid learning, or in some places, kids back at school with a lot of social restrictions. Yeah. But here's what I know to be certain. People are stressed. Oh, yeah. That this, and, you know, this anxiety and this stress of, of what to do with our kids when people are at home working remotely mm -hmm. and now they've got to manage all their own work and career responsibilities and now managing remote learning from kids not to mention the logistics of where's everyone going to sit and is our wi-fi going to hold up like there's right. logistics right there's yep. realities there's yep. emotions there's <clears throat> so i put together a training for parents on tools to help manage their own stress and anxiety because i started to say here's what i know for certain if the parents and stress are anxious because they're like asking themselves, 
how can I manage this all? Right. Then emotions are contagious. And so yep. the kids are going to be stressed and anxious. Oh, yeah. And most importantly, when we're operating from a stress mind, we can't learn. Yep. Bottom line. So yep. if parents are trying to prepare their kids for school, they're probably doing so by getting, you know, any notebooks and pencils and equipment and getting the internet online and whatever they're needing to do. Right. But they're likely not checking in with their mental and emotional health and how it's affecting that of their kids, which is going to directly affect how they learn. Yep. So this training is for parents to gain some tools to manage their own anxieties. So ultimately we can have a peaceful and productive home and school year. And this launches and on Monday? This, um, well, the training is already available and the membership the launch is already live, but the founding member price goes up on Friday the 21st. So, Ooh, this so they year, got time. It, they got time, yes. And the cool. links will be in the show notes. I'm going to make sure to get to you. Thank but you. basically what this parenting membership is going to be, it's a year-long membership where for $33 a month, if you sign up by Friday, you're going to, first of all, as soon as you join, you get like 15 videos that I've recorded for you guys in different trainings. Goodness. Like the, the amount of content that you get right off the bat mm -hmm. is awesome. Yeah. But no doubt. each month you're going to get trainings with me. You're going to get life calls. You're going to get meditations for both you and your kids. You're going to get journal prompts for self-reflection and awareness tools. And I mean, this is literally a fraction of what I cost for an hourly rate. So yep. I just, my goal honestly is to give people tools because I see, like you said, this amount of suffering that's out there is really high. And I yeah. know it doesn't have to be this hard. Nope. It never did. And it I wish more people would pay attention. I wish more people would pay attention to the fact that there are tools like this. Because what's interesting is these things are available. Obviously, they're in books, and nobody reads anymore. I don't know what the hell happened to books. I still got shit done. Not with them me. All over I've the got place. a pile of them. Yeah, yes. I I've got books over there on the the counter. I they're not even on the bookshelf. I, you know, I'm trying to. I'm in the middle of five. I think having this as a resource will multiply yeah. the ability of a parent yeah. to viably and, and thank goodness for editing. Yeah, of course. For viably managing both their own emotions and affecting their children in a manner that will positively move them forward. <clears throat> yes. Without stuff like this, what you're offering, I mean, 33 bucks a month. Are you kidding? Seriously? Yeah. Is that all your, that's it for now? Well, if they sign up by Friday the 21st, it's 33. If they sign up afterwards, it's $47 a month. Still, it's only 47? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Considering how much, because I've had therapists that's not even a third that's not even a third no yeah. it's not even a third or a quarter of what you would normally for an hour for an hour you no. guys you're getting 15 videos right out the gate value duh um <clears throat> would you only suggest parents do it or would you think the kids might benefit too you know what there's going to be a lot of tools in here that is going to be for everybody and, and awesome. quite honestly you know and he here's the really reality of it this is focused for parents mm -hmm. And no matter who you are, no matter what your family dynamic looks like, if you're stressed and overwhelmed, this is going to benefit you because at the root of what I'm teaching is mindfulness and meditation and how to integrate it into all aspects of your life. Sweet. Some of the trainings or videos might not apply to you, but I would say 80% of it mm -hmm. is going to be generalized enough because to me, at the root of it are the tools. Sure. How you apply it and who you're talking to might have some nuances and some of the specifics, but the journal prompts, the meditations, the trainings and how to integrate in managing your thoughts, your emotions, what is, you know, even mindful eating, what does that even look like? How do mm -hmm. we move through our days? How do we manage anxiety and stress? How are we integrating gratitude, right. compassion, self-compassion, loving kindness? This is not just for parents. Right. So I would say 80% of it is generalized. So even if you're not dealing with kids and remote learning, but you're managing, how do I, how do I work from home? Right. How do I manage my own anxiety over having to do my career while, you know, my partner is in the next room and on calls and now we've got stress in the home. I mean, like, 
this is the reality of what our world looks like in the year 2020. We never thought we'd be here, and yet here we are. And this is why I am I'm so soul driven in this work. It doesn't feel like work, and yet since COVID hit, I am busier than ever. Mm. And it's amazing because part of it is how to pivot, mm. right? But part of it is being in service and to say, I, I've got tools I know that can, have, that can help people. And in fact, in addition to my private practice and in addition to this membership, I'm actually finishing up a book deadline. My final submission is also due next Friday. <laughs> um, I'm writing a book. You're not busy. <laughs> oh, and I've got my two teenage daughters. No, not busy at all. Not busy at all. <laughs> um, you know, but I can't quite pinpoint just one thing that I want to focus 100% of my work on because I, I, I really, I, I'm just so passionate about people gaining the tools for growth and change because there's a lot of suffering going on. Yep. And whether we're focusing on being more mindful parents, so we're less reactive, so we've got greater compassionate, empathic, connected relationships with our kid, whether we're wanting to shift the culture in our home, whether we're wanting to have really effective communication with our partners so we can actually feel seen, heard, and validated. I often say, I had a recent Instagram post where I said, you know, I've been told since I've been an entrepreneur, I need to pick a niche. I need to pick one ideal client that I work with and just focus my energy there. And I've really struggled because I can't. Because to me, what I'm in the business of doing is helping people be in better relationship. Now, that might be better relationship to themselves, relationship to their partners or spouses, a relationship to their kids. But ultimately, I'm in the business of giving people better tools for better relationships. The tools are the same. How you apply it's going to change. Sure. So I've never decided I only work with couples because I do a lot of couples work and couples therapy, or I only do parenting work, or I only do women who are stuck in their 40s and want to get divorced and not know who they are. Like At the root of it, the tools are the same. And I fall back to those frameworks of mindfulness and meditation because you've got like this time-tested practice that has been around for over 2,500 years that now has Western science back in it to say, here's what's changing in your brain and body. So, so I could talk to you for hours. Well, hold, hold on. I'm going I'm to ask, yes, ask you a question. Yeah. Pre-show, we were talking about how busy it's gotten. And this, yeah. is in, this is in direct relation to what you were told, go, go get a niche and a, and a perfect avatar. And I'm going to share something with you after you yes, answer please. me. You started with how many before? You had my client. Eight, yeah, you had eighteen my to sixteen a week. Were like um, um, probably between like twelve to fifteen. And now on it's average. what? It's what now? Between eighteen and twenty-four a week. Okay. You still think you need a niche? Not at all. Okay, so you're. That's in one why of, I'm in. I'm, I'm in defiance <clears throat> of what I've been told. It's funny. The interesting part about being in defiance is, in actuality, your specific, your specific niche which is being a therapist doesn't always have a perfect avatar. In fact, exactly. not, a, not unlike my business, which is marketing, I've actually got five or six different avatars that are the perfect clients. And it's because sometimes it's the VP of analytics. Sometimes it's the CMO. Sometimes it's the marketing manager. Sometimes it's somebody who's out in front lines that brings me up. When someone says niche down, I think the guys that sell info online, that's who I'm thinking of. The e-commerce guys, the guys that sell coaching and consulting, niche down to just one thing. Can't always do that. Mm -hmm. So I would say you're just in your right lane. That's all that. That's all I think. I don't think you're defying anything. I, I just think, think you're so doing what too. you're supposed to. I mean, yeah, well, just and that's and that's because and you know why? I'm in alignment. You know what? You're in alignment and with I a purpose, and that purpose is driving the business. That's why it's working. And I, I am in complete alignment with myself in my own authenticity. And as soon as I got there, it was like the floodgates opened. So for mm -hmm. all the entrepreneurs listening, the best thing you can do to be successful in your business, and I'm not a business person, I'm a therapist, and... I, I would venture to say the best thing you can do to biz, to grow your business and to be successful in where you want to be is to get out of your own damn way. And that's slowing down to do the work, to look at your roadblocks, to look at your mindset, to look at your old stories that are holding your back, your old belief systems, and to get really curious, does this still apply for me now? Because I, as soon as I got divorced, my manifestation skyrocketed. Mm. 
Nice. There was a lot of energy blocking me. And now given, I didn't have a bad marriage. It just wasn't the right one for me. So I had this more existential crisis. There was no real problems that were tangible. I just wasn't, it just wasn't right. Who mm -hmm. I was at 13 isn't who I was at 32. Go figure, right? <laughs> so my Evolution point is, happens. for the right? So, <clears throat> so for the entrepreneurs listening, if at the very least, anything you get out of this, because maybe you're not a parent, maybe you're not in deep suffering, maybe, you know, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. We all have where we're stuck. And if you're feeling like I'm putting all this effort into what I'm doing and it's just not working, it's just not working, well, then you got to look at yourself. And it's, what is being blocked? Because mm -hmm. something is blocking you from allowing that energy to move forward. And so I, I believe entirely wholeheartedly, like I keep saying, growth and change is possible. Yep. And it's not based on any external factors, right? There is nothing that happened external that's allowed me to manifest all that I have. It's because I actually figured out where was I stuck and how to get out of my own damn way. I think a lot of entrepreneurs would do well to hear this one really, really well. And, and what's really funny is you're not the only one that said it. It's been said a number of different ways, and I still see a ton of entrepreneurs still living that. It's, it's really interesting because to watch. Because it's easier to stay <clears throat> stuck because yep. their belief system and their mindset is being an entrepreneur is hard. What if I can't be successful? I've tried before and it hasn't worked. And so these are self-limiting beliefs that, get in the way of that. And I can be really woo woo and I can really go towards the signs of the universe and law of attraction and spirituality. And I have a big believer in a lot of science that pointed me in the right direction, but I'm also really tangible. Like I'm going to hold space for both, right? I've got the woo woo and I've got the science. Sure. And I, and I want to be a good mix of both. Like I'm going to, you know, and if people aren't also getting out of their own damn way, well, then there's a reason for it. They're not ready to. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Then just, you know, understand that your time will come when you decide you're ready. Yeah. That's, that's really the bottom line. You choose, you choose where you're at at any given yes. time, whether, whether conscious of it or not. Yes. That's what it comes yeah. down to. Absolutely. So we have been rolling this really well. And I want to thank you for, in fact, I'm, I'm fairly sure we have more to talk about. So if I may, I'll just throw it out now. Come back. Would you Absolutely. <laughs> I would love to come back. Cause like I said, I, I think we could talk for hours. And I think we can too. And, and I, yes, I, I'm happy I want to get come back. I want to talk about the book too, when it comes out and all that kind of stuff and stuff. Being where you're at now, the level of success that you're now experiencing. This is a question I ask all of my guests. What's the biggest challenge you're facing at present? Ironically, it's going to be, <laughs> A very ironic answer, given everything I just said. Mm -hmm. Slowing down. When you say slowing down, what does that mean? Well, I started off by talking about how I was on autopilot and, you know, kind of on that hamster wheel of life and spinning for what's next. And one could argue that my busyness is I'm chasing what's next. And I'm not. I actually am really, really present with what is. However, once I recognized how to get out of my own way and realize that my potential was really only limited by me, I am fueled by being in service and I am challenged by knowing I don't have to help everybody. And that's okay. Just because I can, and I know I can, because I, I, I got out of my own damn way. And when I come back, I'm going to tell you that story of my single most life-defining moment to get me there. Mm -hmm. And that's an amazing story that everyone needs to hear. And I'm not just like gratuitously saying no, 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 no. my that's important what we want. story, we want but that. this is like, this is like the single most life defining moment in which I got out of my own damn way and everything from that moment shifted. So for me, my biggest challenge is just because I can, doesn't mean I have to. I want you guys to hear what she just said. When she comes back, which means pay attention because she will be back to share that. Um, and, and you're yeah. absolutely correct. Even in our case, when I was a solopreneur for marketing, I said yes to everybody. And that was a bad, bad idea. Got me into a lot of trouble. Um, at the point of now having an agency and having partners and also having interns, I'm a lot more selective. Yeah. I'm not as active on social media as I used to be. And there's, uh, there's absolute purpose for that. I'm, I, I'm not that guy. I'm not the influencer per se. I have a business to run. You know, yeah. I have to be the business owner and I can post here and there. So like on my personal stuff, I'm a comedian. I post funny shit. That's just yeah. me. Um, I love making people laugh. I love, you know, people know I love coffee. 
my, my, my religious friends think I, I've changed gods, which is hilarious. It's, <laughs> and, and, and I laugh about it all the time. Because like, your new idol, I'm like, well, yeah, second to you know who. But anyway, uh, but yeah, it, it, if, you, if you think about the ability to just, everything we've been talking about, just be present. Stick in the moment. Recognize what the moment is for what it is. And understand that you still can affect that moment. But it's got to be you that does it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the biggest thing I got out of it so far as as yeah. far as this one. I can't wait for the next one. So let's make sure we set that up. Absolutely, we'll do. Want to thank everybody, especially our guest Jere. Thank you so much for you hanging are out with so us welcome on Java for Chat. having me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the next one. We're gonna have a blast. Uh, Fabulous. You guys know how we love to end this. We love every single one of you that watches, listens. By the way, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit subscribe and, and the bell. The bell. The bell's important. Otherwise, you'll never see when one of these gets posted. Mm -hmm. So hit that bell too. Um, the links for yes. Jerry will be posted on the bottom. Uh, her website, her the new link for the the new link for the membership site will be up first, and then all of the other stuff that you can get a hold of her. Follow on and Instagram. And it's really easy. My website is my name, JeriRose.com. Oh. Well, no one knows how to sp spell jury yet, so we'll have to, yeah, we'll have so to make it'll sure. It'll be on there. It'll be on there. It's also on the description for the podcast. If you guys are listening on any of the other platforms like um, Spotify, Stitcher, or anything like that, please know that you probably find all the links back on anchor.fm, which is where we're at presently. And uh, if you want to support us, feel free to support us. You know, There's a little button in there on Anchor. You can support your, your favorite podcasters. We appreciate everything that you do. So with that said, stay up. Stay safe, stay healthy, and live. From both of us to all of you, ciao for now. Thanks so much. For more information on Java Chat, visit www.javachatpodcast.com. You've been listening to Coffee with Mike on Java Chat. Tune in weekly to this podcast for the next episode. You can also download or subscribe today on your favorite podcast platform. A production of Oasis Media Group, LLC. Located in Las Vegas, Nevada. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.